let me first say that uh, it's, uh, it's both a great joy and a privilege to, to have the opportunity to be in Vilnius and, 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 and speak this, uh, uh, th this morning. In, in addition, uh, there are also many good friends and colleagues of mine in the, in the, in, in the room, and that makes this, uh, for me, a special occasion. Now, um, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. This is what uh, Sir Winston Churchill said in a speech made in the House of Commons in 1948. And uh, learning from history and previous mistakes is, of course, important in every walk of life. But I also think that it's perhaps even more important to us who work with financial stability and macroprudential uh, uh, policy. And with my background as a central banker and many years of experience in handling banking and financial crisis, I do believe that Churchill's uh, saying is, uh, is true, and it's true uh, today as uh, ever uh, before. The only way we can uh, address and perhaps even prevent economic crisis is by understanding their causes. And here, what history has shown time and time again is that financial crises uh, tend to follow quite predictable patterns. We are all familiar with the origin of the last financial crisis, and we all know uh, what prominent role the residential real estate market and mortgage, and mortgage market markets played in the severity and in the persistence of the, of the crisis, not only in the U.S., but actually in many other parts of the world uh, as well. There is an increasing uh, empirical liter literature almost always showing that leverage, excessive risk-taking, and misaligned incentives in residential and commercial real estate very often lead to externalities uh, with implications both for financial stability and, at the end, uh, for the real economy as well. Now, because of the systemic importance of the res residential real estate sector, I truly believe that macroprudential policy has a key role to play in order to preserve macroeconomic and financial uh, stability. Uh, this policy area offers many tools targeted specifically at addressing risks in the residential uh, real estate uh, sector. Now, the interaction uh, between macroprudential policy and housing prices is by uh, no means a completely new subject to me, neither in my role as governor of the Riksbank, uh, in which I have tried to deal with the issues for many years, nor in my role as uh, chair of the ESRB's advisory uh, technical committee, where this topic has gained increased attention in the last few years. Now, there are many aspects and challenges to bear in mind when discussing this uh, topic. So for this reason, I truly welcome the, the discussion at this conference, and I also thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. The topic of my speech, to a large degree, covers the theme uh, for the first session today, namely whether macroprudential policy should have explicit goals for house price uh, growth or not. Hopefully, my remarks will uh, illustrate some of the challenges in all of this, both analytical challenges and pedagogical challenges. That on, and these are challenges that policymakers face when deciding on the appropriate way of bringing house price developments into macroprudential policy uh, decision making. But in order for me to adequately address this theme, I think it's important to take a step back and remember why macroprudential policy exists and recall the main purposes of this uh, and this rather new uh, policy uh, field. Now, put simply, uh, macroprudential policy has two main tasks. First, it should strengthen the resilience of the financial system as a whole, and second, it should uh, counteract the buildup of, of financial imbalances that could later lead to costly adjustments. In the context of risks and vulnerabilities related to the re residential real estate sector, macroprudential policy uh, measures not only can reinforce this, the resilience of banks and households, 
but also counteract the buildup of financial imbalances uh, by influencing the supply or the demand of credit. But at the same time, it's actually quite tricky to measure the effectiveness of macroprudential policy. And this is because it's uh, difficult, if not impossible, to measure the scale of reduction of systemic risk uh, when you apply various policy measures. Now, one consequence of this is that the empirical evidence on the effectiveness of macroprudential policies is still fairly limited, but it's actually increasing quite rapidly in pace. Nonetheless, some studies do exist, and they seem to suggest that borrow-based, that is the demand-side-based policies, uh, such as uh, limits on loan-to-value and debt-to-income ratios, are more effective in managing credit flow and housing prices than lender-based, that is supply-side policies, such as uh, capital and uh, liquidity buffers. Borrower-based policies seem to be more effective uh, when growth rates of housing prices and credit are very high. So ideally, uh, macroprudential policy should serve to mitigate pro-cyclicality in the behavior of uh, households and financial institutions. In other words, it should be counter-cyclical. Macroprudential policy should be tighter when there is a high risk of imbalances uh, building up. And that may imply a need to quantify the macroprudential policy objective and to set a quantitative target, for example, uh, by introducing various uh, macroprudential policy rules. Yet, there are many, many challenges uh, associated with this. So let me discuss some of the aspects that I think need to be considered uh, before one introduces uh, those types of rules. All in all, I think that nowadays there is a broad agreement that there are many advantages in setting specific targets and uh, rules for uh, macroprudential uh, policy. As a central banker, I think that uh, actually there's a certain degree of analogy to be made here with monetary policy. For example, having an inflation target will help stabilize inflation expectations and also make it easier uh, to influence actual inflation. Having an explicit numerical inflation target will also constitute the benchmark against which the effectiveness of monetary policy is measured. So, setting a specific target will consequently help to increase both transparency and accountability, and both are actually essential when you conduct various types of economic policies. All these benefits, they're of course also actually applicable when setting rules for macro, macro prudential policy. There might even be a case to be made that rules are even more appropriate in this policy field. For, in, for instance, setting specific rules might be particularly useful when models and instruments are not fully developed, and that's much uh, the case uh, when it comes to various types of macroprudential policies uh, today. Explicit rules, they can contribute to increased transparency and also to better communication of macroprudential policy uh, decisions. It may reduce the risk of inaction bias and relieve the pressure on policy policymakers to abstain from policy adjustments uh, during economic and expansion when any discretionary tightening might be uh, challenged by uh, public uh, myopia. Undoubted, undoubtedly, there are also some obvious problems relating to setting specific uh, rules for complex uh, policy issues. So let me discuss some of uh, those complexities in, res in relation to res residential real estate. And I'm going to give you my view of, uh, of the question of today's uh, first session. Uh, should macroprudential policy have explicit goals uh, for house price uh, growth? Now, there are important challenges uh, regarding setting a specific numeric target for house price growth, like for inflation in monetary policy. F for the macroprudential authority or any policy 
maker for that matter, it's hard to know what con constitutes the correct price growth rate at a given uh, time. We have to admit that housing prices are, deter housing prices are determined by a range of different factors uh, that are both cyclical and structural in nature. For example, a low interest rate environment and expansionary monetary policy might entail a higher price growth uh, rate that, what, than, what, uh, than what is expected in steady state. And the same can actually be said about uh, expansionary fiscal policy, which could lead to rising incomes and wealth in the household sector. There are also uh, supply side factors like low residential housing construction and rent controls which may influence the prevailing uh, price growth rate. These are supply side and demand side factors that macroprudential policy might find uh, in some instances very hard to uh, counteract. There would also be some practical problems if we were to start targeting a single house price index. For instance, aggregate house price data could mask trends that exist at the regional level. Correspondingly, prices might increase differently uh, depending on housing tenure, for example, for single-family houses and apartments. Let me take housing prices in Sweden as, a, as an example to illustrate these points. Since 1987, the average annual house price increase in Sweden in real terms, in real terms has been more than 4%. In Stockholm, the corresponding figure is almost 6%. In certain periods, house prices in Stockholm have been increasing by more than 25%. And looking only at apartments, the price increases have been even larger than that. In contrast, in many other cities in the northern parts of Sweden, prices have increased only very modestly. Now, since the range of price increases is so wide, setting an explicit goal for house price growth is incredibly hard, and it would be extremely difficult to create a satisfactory index that captures the dynamics of all regional markets. But that said, aggregate price indices might still guide the policymaker and signal the buildup of risks. For instance, the work on identifying early warning indicators and setting different thresholds for these indicators will certainly help uh, the policymaker to decide when to act in order to avoid risk to, uh, linked to inaction uh, bias. The Basel Committee's uh, reference guide for the countercyclical capital buffer, relating the buffer to the credit to GDP gap, can be seen and should be seen in this context. Of course, one can always discuss the pros and cons of individual indicators, as has certainly been the case when it comes to the credit to uh, GDP gap, and certainly the case when it comes to this region uh, of, uh, of, of, of Europe. One virtue of guidelines uh, like this is that they put some limit on the amount of discretion uh, given to the macroprudential uh, policymaker but relying on a purely mechanical relationship between indicators and macroprudential policy might be probably too crude. I think an element of judgment is still going to be required. Charles Goodhart, Goodhart has referred to this to presumptive indicators. When, for instance, house price growth is deemed to be excessive, excessively high, the macroprudential policymaker has to take a stand and comply or explain the lack of uh, measures taken or not uh, taken. Uh, one concept uh, related uh, to this topic and one concept that has been discussed, for example, within the ESRB is the concept or using the words policy, the policy stance of macroprudential policy. How do we know if macroprudential policy is expansionary or contractionary, and in, in which dimensions do we measure this? This was one, of the main, this was, uh, one main topic on the first annual ESRB uh, conference uh, held uh, last year. Now for me, given what I do, it's kind of obvious uh, to compare with monetary policy. 
The, st the, the task of assessing the stance of monetary policy is easier. Uh, but developments after the global financial crisis and the downward trend in the long-run real interest rate globally have made it hard to know exactly, uh, also here, how expansionary monetary policy actually is. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the goals of macroprudential policy are diverse and they're complex, both providing a resilient financial system and mitigating financial imbalances. So needless to say, taking a stand on the stance of macroprudential policy is challenging, uh, to say uh, the least. Hence, the work on intermediate policy objectives and the work on indicators going on at the ESRB and in other places is very, very important. Hopefully, uh, we will eventually be able to be more specific on the assessment of the macroprudential policy stance in the not so uh, different, uh, distant future. Another interesting comparison with monetary policy is that regard, regarding the policy interest rate, decisions are normally uh, being made with fixed time intervals. Once again, referring to the countercyclical capital buffer, regardless of what indicators the designed authority chooses to look at, the legislation prescribes reviewing the appropriate buffer with fixed time intervals, for example, once every quarter. And this is another way in, in which inaction bias can be reduced since it forces the policymaker uh, to regularly take a stand on the appropriate action or no action. Now, while I have my doubts for setting explicit numerical goals for house price growth, uh, we must not let data limitations get in the way of addressing uh, the larger question at hand or to use a famous idiom, we still have to be able to see the forest for all the trees. We must not forget that large upswings in housing prices and debt levels have often been followed by periods of financial instability and uh, recession, what we heard just a few minutes ago uh, this uh, morning. And this is one of the reasons why I am f a firm believer that macroprudential policy has a key role in reducing uh, systemic risk stemming from, residential real estate, from the residential real estate sector. And this is also why we at the Riksbank have for a long, long time now been urging the Swedish FSA, which is responsible for macroprudential policy in my country, to implement measures such as uh, limit to, uh, limits to loan-to-value ratios, debt-to-income ratios, as well as uh, requirements on amortization. All of this in order to curb the developments on the Swedish housing and uh, mortgage market uh, presently. But again, regarding the situation in my country, other policies also need to play their parts. Uh, not least housing and tax policy. We cannot rely on macroprudential policy to handle the more structural problems uh, in our housing market. At the Riksbank, Bank, we have also been advocating uh, policies influencing the structural characteristics of the housing market. Such policies should address the tax treatment of interest rate deduct tax deductibility, the regulation of the rental market, or regulatory, regulatory constraints on developing uh, new housing. Now, there are certainly limits to the amount of fine-tuning uh, that can be done with macroprudential uh, policies alone. For me, measures such as LTV and DTI limits are a little bit like setting speed limits for banks and households. That's saying up to here but not beyond. That's essentially what LTIs and DTIs do. In addition, uh, we cannot and should not discard the role of monetary policy in tackling these issues. If monetary policy, which is the case right now, is very expansionary over a long period of time, this uh, could contribute uh, to, to distorted expectations of how low, how low interest rates will be in the future and how the housing market will develop, and it also could lead to increased risk-taking in the economy.
Personally, I do think that macroeconomic stability, financial stability, and price stability are uh, closely interlinked. If, if you miss on one of them, you're highly likely to get a problem on the other ones uh, at, at well. And one of the key challenges going forward is to find a proper combination of monetary policy on the one hand and macro, uh, macro prudential uh, policies on the other hand. But at the same time, we shouldn't forget, actually, that it's essential that each individual household and each, individual's, it's easy, and each, individual, each individual bank is responsible to ensure uh, sound uh, borrowing and lending. Because this is a central principle in a market-based system and something we should not forget in the debate about macroprudential uh, policies. Uh, this is also why I think it's important for banks and policymakers to increase uh, public awareness about the risks stemming from high debt and house price uh, levels. And here, communication is going to be key, and I think we can all do better in educating the general public uh, about these uh, issues. For us policymakers, this also means that measures taken in one area must take into account what is being done in other areas. The left hand needs to know what the right hand is doing, even if they are not completely uh, coordinated. And that holds specifically if uh, policies are spread out between uh, many different uh, authorities. In addition, policymakers need to be forward-looking, since it very often takes time for measures to have an impact. And this is especially true for measures that affect the supply of housing. But it's also true for flow measures uh, with, with a declared macroprudential intent. We have to acknowledge that many of these issues are like uh, changing the direction of an ocean liner. It will take time before we will see any results and different policy areas in the best of worlds uh, should work uh, together. All in all, we as policymakers and central bankers can do a lot of things to mitigate risks uh, stemming from the mortgage and housing market. Certainly, we cannot complain that there are no available tools at our disposal. So then why are we in many countries still uh, lagging behind in taking policy actions despite our, despite our better uh, judgment? In Sweden, for instance, it has proven exceedingly difficult uh, to deal with issues surrounding the mortgage market and housing market. And there is a strong political reluctance to take action. Politicians and various authorities seem to agree about the diagnosis, but apparently it, all, it seems to be extremely hard to agree on the right uh, prescription. I'm fairly certain that the, that the reason is inaction bias. When housing prices are high and housing prices are going up, people are making money, and they do not want policymakers to take away the proverbial punch bowl. And the combination of certain short-term costs and uncertain long-term benefits, this creates incentives for politicians and macroprudential authorities uh, to postpone uh, policy actions. For me, practical policymaking always entails making decisions under uncertainty. We will not always know what the counterfactual is going to be. It's for this reason unavoidable that practical policymaking in the coming years will consist to a great extent of learning by doing uh, with the emphasis on both learning and doing. Now, this is one of the first, con uh, although it's one of the first concepts you learn in, 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 introductory economic, in an introductory economics class and goes to the core uh, of economic thinking, policymakers must understand that there's no such thing as a free lunch. There is no way around the fact that measures will have short-term costs, and they are going to, if they are going to be effective. And there is no magic uh, bullet in this. There's always trade-offs uh, when you do these things. But at the end of the day, authorities are responsible for taking action if developments on the residential real estate 
market uh, threaten macroeconomic and financial uh, stability. So there has to be somebody who takes away the punch bowl before the party uh, gets uh, going. Let me, con uh, let me conclude. Now, uh, let me conclude here where I began by echoing the sentiment of Churchill's warnings about not learning from past mistakes. I have already highlighted the fact that understanding the causes of previous economic and financial crises is going to be essential in preventing a future uh, crisis. But knowledge itself is no guarantee uh, that we will be able to safeguard macroeconomic and financial uh, stability uh, going forward. In order to avoid the risk of collective amnesia, it is uh, crucial to create an institutional framework that stimulates uh, macroprudential action. Setting specific macroprudential policy rules might be one way of doing this, and it's certainly a question how, uh, worth asking how to do this. And uh, with these words, I anticipate a productive discussion to this issue and other issues in the next few hours. And uh, once again, it's been a privilege for me to give this speech this morning. Thank you.